The final unit in this class was parametric and polar curves. And within that unit, the first lesson we discussed, the first thing we discussed were conic sections. And we learned how to graph parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas. So the first thing that we're going to do is find the vertex, vertex, focus, and directrix. You can just sketch them on the graph of this parabola. So to find the vertex, focus, and directrix, I'm going to have to complete the square. So rewrite this as y squared plus 2y equals negative 12x minus 25. Now we add half of the linear term square it's coefficient to both sides. So half of 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1, so add 1 on this side, add 1 on that side. On the left, we have y plus 1 squared, meaning we're going to have a sideways parabola, equals negative 12x minus 24, or y plus 1 squared equals negative 12 times x plus 2. So that tells us that the vertex is at the point negative 2, negative 1. So back to down 1 right there. Now the we have that 12 equals 4p. This will let us find the directrix. So 3 equals p. So the focus is a distance of 3 away from the vertex. And the directrix is a distance of 3 away. And because we have this negative, our parabola is going to open to the left, which means that this is the directrix. And because p is 3, we know we have points 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 away from that, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 away from that. So roughly speaking, there is your parabola. And just in case it's not clear, that point right there is the focus, and this line is the directrix. All right, find the vertices of the ellipse and sketch its graph. So we also have to complete the square here, but only with the x portion. So factor out that 4, x squared plus 2x plus y squared equals 0. Now half of 2 squared is 1. We add 1. Because of the 4 outside the parentheses, we effectively actually added 4. So that's 4 times x plus 1, the quantity squared, plus y squared equals 4. Or x plus 1 squared over 1 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. So this ellipse is sort of centered at negative 1, 0. And has two vertices left and right of that point, 1. And two more up and down, 2 from that point. So there's your ellipse. And then finally we have a hyperbola. So y squared plus 2y, I'm going to move all the y's and x's in the same side. So y squared plus 2y minus 4x squared equals 3. So once again, I have to complete the square. So I will add 1 and add 1. That makes y plus 1 squared minus 4x squared equals 4. So y plus 1 squared over 4 minus x squared over 1 equals 1. So this hyperbola is centered at the point 0, negative 1. Now from that point we go up and down 2, and then side to side 1, and find the asymptotes. And because the y squared is the positive term, this hyperbola will live on the y-axis, or it is a vertical hyperbola. Now, next we discussed parameterized curves, and these are curves where you can think of 
t as being another variable that is, say, time, and you are looking at sort of how the particle traces the path as time goes along. So the best way to plot these is just to plot some points. So let's pick a t, find an x and a y, and we were told that t is between negative 1 and 4. So when we input t equals negative 1, x will be negative 1, and y will be 7. If we input 0, x is negative 2, y is 5. Inputting 1, x is negative 1, y is 3. Inputting 2, x is 2, and y is 5 minus 4, or 1. If we input 3, x is 9 minus 2, which is 7, and y is 5 minus 6, or negative 1. If we input 4, 16, the x is 12, and the y is negative 3. So let's graph those points. Negative 1, 7. Negative 2, 5. Negative 1, 3. 2, 1. 3, negative 1. No, sorry, 7, negative 1. And then 12, negative 3 is a bit off my graph, so I'm sorry. Something way out there, and it's traced in that direction. So we have some kind of sideways parabola thing going on here. Now the next thing we're going to do is eliminate the parameter and find a Cartesian equation of the curve. So for that, we can use some kind of substitution. So it's probably easiest, and also because this is a sideways parabola, you're going to have x equals something with y's in it in some form. So what you can do is take the y equation and get the t by itself, and then input that for the t in the other equation. So we have y minus 5 equals negative 2t or t equals y minus 5 over negative 2, or t is 5 minus y over 2. And then x will equal 5 minus y over 2, that thing squared, minus 2, which if you really cared to, you could write as 5 minus y, the quantity squared, over 4 minus 2. Anyhow, it is a sideways parabola. No need to do anything more with the equation than that. Next, let's do one with some trigonometry. So x is equal to 4 cosine theta minus 2, and y is 5 sine theta. So we have theta, x, and y. And let's just start with theta equals 0. At 0, cosine is 1, so we have 4 minus 2 is 2. At 0, sine is 0, so that coordinate is just 0. The next easy number to plug in would be pi halves. At pi halves, cosine is 0, so we have 0 minus 2 gives us negative 2. And sine of pi halves is 1, so we have 1 times 5 is 5. Next, let's input pi. If we input pi, cosine is negative 1, negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. And then sine is going to be 0 again. Next, we have 3 pi over 2. At 3 pi over 2, cosine is 0. Minus 2 will give us negative 2. And the y is negative 5. And inputting 2 pi is the same as 0, so we're back at the point 2 comma 0. So 2, 0, negative 2, 5, negative 6, 0, negative 2, negative 5, so something going like this. Oops. Oh man, that's terrible. And in this direction. 
So it's looking a bit like it might be an ellipse. And how you prove that is you end up using the fact that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. So in this first equation, get the cosine theta by itself. x plus 2 over 4 will equal cosine of theta. So x plus 2 squared over 4 squared plus, and then for the sine, y over 5 equals sine of theta. So plus y over 5 squared equals 1. So that's x plus 2 squared over 16 plus y squared over 25 equals 1, which is the equation of an ellipse centered at negative 2, 0, which sort of makes sense. There's the center point. From that point, I went left and right 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and up and down 5. The next thing we did was discuss how to apply the calculus that we know to the parametric curves. And the first thing is how do you find a derivative? And once you have a derivative, you can find the equations of tangent lines. So dy dx was equal to dy dt over dx dt. And now, before we proceed, I'm going to simplify this a little bit y will equal t minus 2 ln of t. You can just use your properties of exponents to pull that power of t down. So dy dt will be 1 minus 2 over t. dx dt will be e to the root t times 1 half t to the negative 1 half. And that simplifies slightly to 1 minus 2 over t e to the root t over 2 root t. And I'm not going to simplify that further because what I'm going to do now is just plug in t equals 1. So the slope of my tangent line is 1 minus 2 over e over 2, which is the same thing as 1, sorry, negative 1 over e over 2, or negative 2 over e. And to find the equation of the tangent line, I have to also find the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate at t equals 1. So if t equals 1, the x is equal to e, and y is equal to 1. So the equation of the tangent line is y minus 1 equals negative 2 over e, x minus e which if you want to get that in slope intercept form is y minus 1 equals negative 2 over e x plus 2 or y equals negative 2 over e x plus 3. Unless I explicitly ask you to get something into slope intercept form, technically you don't have to. So you could just save yourself some work and leave it at the sort of red step. And if we know how to find first derivatives, which would tell us where a function is increasing, decreasing, given the slopes of tangent lines, we also would like to figure out second derivatives which tell us about concavity. So to find the second derivative, you first need the first derivative. So dy dt dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt which will be 1 minus 1 over t over 1 plus 1 over t, which I'm going to simplify to t minus 1 over t plus 1. I got that by multiplying the numerator and denominator both by t. Now the second derivative, d squared y over dx squared, is the derivative of the first derivative, or it's the derivative with respect to t of dy dx over dx dt. So to differentiate the first derivative, I have to use the quotient rule. So that's t plus 1 
times 1 minus t minus 1 times 1 all over t plus 1 squared. That whole quantity divided by 1 plus 1 over t. Now this simplifies to 2 over t plus 1 squared divided by t plus 1 over t. That denominator was found by getting a common denominator there, t over t. Now we reciprocate the denominator, and we have 2 over t plus 1 squared times t over t plus 1 will equal 2t over t plus 1 cubed. So there is the second derivative. So our second derivative was 2t over t plus 1 cubed. We need to determine the sign of this second derivative. So the second derivative is either 0 or undefined at negative 1 and 0, where those are t values. For numbers prior to negative 1, so something like negative 2, if we input that, the numerator is negative, the denominator is negative, so overall your second derivative is positive there. If we input something like, say, negative 1 half, the numerator is negative, the denominator is positive, and past 0 we'd have positive. So this function is concave down if the second derivative is negative, and that is true for negative 1 less than t less than 0. So for t is between negative 1 and 0, this function is concave down. The derivative can also be used to determine where the tangent is horizontal or vertical. So to determine this, you just need the first derivative. So dy dx will equal dy dt over dx dt which is 6t squared plus 6t divided by 6t squared plus 6t minus 12. And let's factor that. We have 6 times t squared plus t over 6 times t squared plus t minus 2, which factors into 6t t plus 1 over 6 times t plus 2 t minus 1. So we have that the tangent is horizontal if t is equal to 0 and negative 1. Now these correspond to the points 0, 1, and 14, 2, respectively. You find those by plugging these t's into the equations. And it's vertical if t is equal to negative 2 and positive 1. And those correspond to the points 20, 3 and negative 8, 6 on your curve, respectively. Meaning that negative 2 yields the 20, 3 point and 1 yields the negative 8 comma 6 point. Find the exact length of the curve x equals 1 plus 3t squared and y equals 4 plus t cubed for t between 0 and 1. So this might be the case that you have some kind of particle that traces a path and the length of the curve allows you to tell how far that particle went. Now the arc length formula for curves was the integral from well a to b square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So that will be the integral from 0 to 1. So dx dt is 6t and dy dt is 3t squared. So when I square dx dt, I get 36t squared. And when I square dy dt, I get 
9t to the fourth. Now these integrals are often very tricky to sort of like work out on your own, or just, so they often involve tricks. Here the trick is you can take out a GCF of t squared, 36. So t squared times 36 plus 9t squared. And when it comes out of the root sign, it becomes a t. And this is helpful because you can now do a substitution. You can let u equal 36 plus 9t squared. du will equal 18t dt. So 1 18th du equals t dt. And if t equals 1, or sorry, t equals 0, this implies that u is equal to 36. And if t equals 1, u is 45. So this becomes the integral from 36 to 45. 1 18th u to the 1 half du. And now you can actually have to differentiate that. So that's 1 18th u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. So that will be 1 over 27 times 45 to the 3 halves power minus 36 to the 3 halves power. And even though you can work out 36 to the 3 halves power not too, with too much difficulty, that quite frankly is just good enough. Probably what will happen on your final is you'll be asked to set up an integral, not actually solve it. Now the next thing we discussed was how to find areas enclosed by parametric curves. So we want to find the area enclosed by the curve x equals t squared minus 2t and y equals root t and the y-axis. So notice that the curve will intersect the y-axis if x is equal to 0. So 0 equals t squared minus 2t. And this occurs at t equals 0 and t equals 2. And those correspond to points of y equaling 0 and y equaling root 2. And then just plugging in a few points, you can verify, like say, if you plug in, I don't know, t equals 1. When you plug in t equals 1, the y is 1 and the x is negative 1. So your curve looks something like this-ish, with this being the point 0 and that being the point root 2. So the area there will be given by an integral from 0 to root 2. Because that is on the left side of the y-axis, we'll have to do 0 minus x and then times dy. And we can use our parameterizations if we change those values to t's. So 0 to 2, negative x. x is the t squared minus 2t. And dy, or the derivative of y, would be 1 half t to the negative 1 half dt. So this is the same thing as the integral from 0 to 2, negative t squared plus 2t over 2 root t dt, which is the same thing as 1 half times the integral from 0 to 2, t to negative t to the 3 halves plus t to the 1 half. That's just subtracting the exponents and factoring out the one half. Now if we anti-differentiate, we have negative t to the 5 halves times 2 fifths plus t to the 3 halves times 2 thirds evaluated from 0 to 2. And when you input everything and work out all the details, you end up with 8 root 2 over 15. And we also discussed how to find surface area for parameterized curves. So for rotation about the x-axis, the surface area was given by 2 pi 
integral from it, some alpha to some beta y times the root of, well in this case it'd be dx d theta, but dx d theta squared plus dy d theta squared d theta. And if we input everything, we have 2 pi integral from 0 to pi over 2. y is 4 sine cubed of theta. Okay, now we have to find dx d theta and dy d theta, and both involve the chain rule. So dx d theta will be 4 times 3 cosine squared theta multiplied by negative sine theta and dy d, d theta will be 4 times 3 sine squared theta multiplied by cosine of theta. Alright, so what I have there is 12 cosine squared theta sine theta squared, notice the negative does not matter because of the fact that we have this thing squared, plus 12 sine squared theta cosine of theta, that quantity squared. Now that 12 can factor out, and this 4 will factor out, we'll have 8 pi times 12, integral from 0 to pi over 2, sine cubed of theta. Now inside that root sign I have cosine to the fourth theta sine squared theta plus sine to the fourth theta cosine squared theta. Of course there's a d theta, I just cannot fit it. And the greatest common factor there inside that root sign is sine squared theta cosine squared theta. And if you factor that out, you're left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And now that whole thing rooted, so 8 times 12, 96, 96 pi, integral from 0 to pi over 2, sine cubed of theta. So cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, and the root of sine squared is sine times cosine. So that's an integral, 96 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2, sine to the fourth theta times cosine of theta, d theta. And from there it's a pretty easy u substitution. u let u equal sine of theta, and du is cosine of theta, d theta, and if theta equals 0, u is equal to 0, and if theta is pi over 2, u is equal to 1. So this becomes 96 pi integral 0 to 1, u to the fourth du. So that's 96 over pi over 5, u to the fifth from 0 to 1, which will just be 96 pi fifths. After discussing parametrized curves, we also discuss polar coordinates and polar curves. So plot the point of polar coordinates to negative pi six, and then find its Cartesian coordinates. So if we have our origin O, so we need a line segment of length 2 with angle negative pi 6. So there's the point approximately, negative pi over 6. And this is 2. Now x is equal to r cosine of theta, and y is r sine theta. So x is 2 cosine negative pi 6. So cosine of negative pi 6 is root 3 over 2. So the x-coordinate is root 3, and y is 2 sine of negative pi 6.
and sine of negative pi 6 is negative 1 half, so 2 times negative 1 half gives us a y coordinate of negative 1. Next we have a Cartesian coordinate of a, a point with Cartesian coordinates negative 2, negative 2. Find two sets of polar coordinates, one with positive, negative r and one with positive r for this point. So the point negative 2, 2 is back 2, down 2. Okay, so first let's find the r. r will equal the square root of x squared plus y squared. So r is the root of 4 plus 4, or root 8. So r equals 2 root 2, or negative 2 root 2. So if we use positive 2 root 2, one way to express that angle would be to say 5 pi quarters. That's if you go this direction. Another way with positive r would be 2 root 2 and to go backwards negative 3 pi quarters. Okay, now if we let our r equal negative 2 root 2, so that means I have to go here and reflect. So that means my angle must be pi quarters. Another way to express that would have been negative 2 root 2, negative 7 pi quarters. And of course you could add 2 pi to any of those thetas and it would also be a point. So there are an infinite number of answers if you want to get really creative. Now, because we have a very specific parameterization, we're going to use, this determines how we find slopes of tangent line to polar curves. So recall that x is equal to r cosine of theta, and y is equal to r sine theta. If we want to find dy dx, we have to find dy d theta over dx d theta. I find this much easier just to rederive every time rather than memorize it. So the derivative of y will be dr d theta sine theta plus r cosine of theta over dx d theta will be dr d theta cosine theta minus r sine theta. And dr d theta will be negative 2 sine 2 theta. So my derivative is negative 2 sine 2 theta times the sine of theta plus 1 plus cosine of 2 theta times cosine of theta over negative 2 sine 2 theta times cosine of theta minus 1 plus cosine 2 theta times sine of theta. And now if you input theta equals pi over 3, we have negative 2 sine of 2 pi over 3, which is root 3 over 2, multiplied by sine of pi over 3, which is just also root 3 over 2, plus cosine of 2 pi over 3, which is negative 1 half, multiplied by cosine of root 3, which is positive 1 half all divided by negative 2. So once again, a sine of 2 theta will be root 3 over 2. Then we'll have a cosine of pi thirds is a half. Cosine of 2 theta will be, once again, 1 plus negative 1 half, and the sine will be root 3 over 2. And then simplifying, oh goodness, so the first term will be 3 halves but negative. That comes from this. Next we have 1 half times 1 half, which is a quarter, so plus 1 quarter, all over. So I can factor out that root 3 over 2, which 
would have been a 1 half root 3 over 2 multiplied by negative 1 plus a half. Now when you get a common denominator, the numerator is negative 5 quarters. And we'll reciprocate both things in the denominator, so 2 over root 3 and 2 over 1, leaving us with negative 5 over, well, negative 2 over 1, positive 5 over root 3, which simplifies to 5 root 5 root 3 over 3. Now one pretty tricky thing with graphing polar with polar curves is both graphing them and figuring out where they intersect. So the polar curve r equals 2 isn't too difficult. That is just a circle of radius 2. Now r equals 4 cosine of 2 theta is going to be one of those flowery things. So I'm going to start by graphing the 4 cosine of 2 theta in the Cartesian system. So if this is theta and this is r. So the period of that's going to be pi. So if pi, 2 pi. Within 2 pi it will run through 2 cycles. So halfway is pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and then half of that are all the quarters. And cosine will begin at, this will begin at 4, I have a lowest point of negative 4. We'll go roughly speaking like this. One cycle in pi, one cycle in 2 pi. So now plotting that in polar curves, I'm going to draw in angles at my quarters. So there's pi quarters. Okay. So now first, Let's talk about this part. So when I have an angle of 0, I start off at 4, and then as I approach pi quarters, my angle goes down to 0. So there's the first portion of the graph. Next, once I'm at pi halves, I'm at negative 4, so that means that this point there will reflect down here, and I will go like this next because all the points over in this portion are reflecting down into that portion. And then I think it makes sense that as you go back up to zero, you're going to go up to there. Okay, and now as you approach pi, you're back at four. So as we approach pi, the radius is back at 4. And now we repeat. So as we go down to 5 pi quarters, the radius goes to 0, so that's this portion. As we go to 3 pi halves, the radius is negative 4, which means we're going to reflect up into that quadrant. And then we go back down, and then finish her off. So roughly speaking, there is your curve. And the r equals 2 curve will be a radius of 2. And you can see there that there are 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 points of intersection. So you'll have points of intersection if 2 equals 4 cosine of 2 theta. So 1 half equals cosine of 2 theta. And this occurs if, so cosine is 1 half at pi thirds. 5 pi thirds. Because we go through 2 pi, we'll have to do two sort of cycles of this. So pi thirds, 5 pi thirds, that would be 
7 pi thirds and 11 pi thirds, which dividing by 2 gives you theta equals pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. And you can find the rest by noticing that you could have also had the curve r equals negative 2. That's the same thing as r equals 2. So if you had negative 2 equaling 4 cosine 2 theta, figuring out when cosine of 2 theta is negative 1 half, and that would occur at theta equals 2 pi thirds, well, 2 theta equals 2 pi thirds, 4 pi thirds, 8 pi thirds, and 10 pi thirds, which corresponds to the point of intersection theta equals pi thirds, 2 pi thirds, 4 pi thirds, and 5 pi thirds. Next, let's sketch the curve r equals sine of 2 theta. So this is pretty similar to sketching the previous curve. So sine of 2 theta, first let's sketch it in Cartesian coordinates. So theta r pi 2 pi. So once again, the period of this function will be pi. Pi over 2, 3 pi halves, and then all the quarters. Now the difference here is the sine curve begins at 0. By pi quarters, it'll be up at 1. By pi halves back at 0. So there's the first period of the sine function. And the second one does the same thing. Now graphing that in Cartesian, or in polar coordinates, sorry. So what matters are my quarter angles again. So there's my quarter angle. Here's my quarter angle. So it starts off as I go from, so I start off at zero, radius of zero at an angle of zero. As my angle increases to pi quarters, my radius increases to one. And then as I approach pi halves, my radius decreases back to zero. So that first loop is traced between zero and pi halves. Now as I approach 3 pi quarters, my radius approaches negative 1, so that means that this point right there is reflecting down to there. These points over there are reflecting down to here. And then back up to 0. Next, as my radius increases past pi over to 5 pi quarters, once again, up to 1, by 3 pi halves back to 0, and lastly, I will trace this final loop. So those should all be equal. I'm not going to really grade your art, but roughly speaking, there is the curve. Find the area enclosed by one loop of the curve, and then use this to find the area enclosed by all loops of the curve. So what you have to remember is that the area formula is 1 half the integral from, say, some alpha to some beta, r squared d theta. And our first loop is traced from 0 to pi over 2. And our r is sine of 2 theta squared. So that's the same thing as 1 half the integral from 0 to pi over 2 sine squared 2 theta, and we have to use the double angle identities to change that. So 1 half times 1 half integral from 0 to pi over 2 1 minus cosine of 4 theta. So that's 1 quarter times theta minus 1 quarter sine of 4 theta. So that will be 1 quarter times pi over 2, because every other term is 0. So one loop has an area of pi over 8. Since there are four loops total, the total area is pi eighths times 4, or pi over 2. We also discussed how to find lengths of curves with polar coordinates. So the length of a curve was given by the integral from, say, alpha to beta, root r squared 
plus dr d theta squared d theta. So our alpha and beta are 0 and 2 pi thirds. So r squared will be 25 sine squared theta. dr d theta is 5 cosine. 5 cosine of theta, so that will be 25 cosine squared theta. So all in all, this will actually be the integral from 0 to 2 pi thirds of 5 d theta, because you can factor up to 25 from the root, leaving you sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So 5 theta, 0 to 2 pi thirds, so that will be 10 pi over 3. And the final topic we discussed was how to find the area of a surface. So we have when it's rotated about either the polar axis or the origin. So if we have a rotation about r equals 2 sine theta about the polar axis, first we have to figure out what this looks like and how quickly it's spanned. So If you graph that by just plugging in thetas, when you plug in 0, you get 0. When you plug in pi over 2, you get 2. And plugging in pi, you're back at 0. So this is spanned between 0 and pi. And the surface area formula is 2 pi integral from alpha to beta f of theta sine theta times the root of f of theta squared plus f prime of theta squared d theta. Remember that f of theta really is just r. So that's 2 pi integral from 0 to pi 2 sine of theta multiplied by sine of theta square root of 4 sine squared theta plus 4 cosine squared theta. So that makes 4 pi integral 0 to pi sine squared theta times 2. The stuff in the root sign, the 4 factors out, it roots to 2, and you're left with sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So that will be 8 pi integral from 0 to pi 1 half, 1 minus cosine of 2 theta, once again using the same identities of the previous problem, well, two problems ago. So that will be 4 pi times theta minus 1 half sine of 2 pi from 0 to pi. And that will just give us 4 pi times pi, or 4 pi squared.